shepherd and king, I find you within me for you.
thankful for that. And I pray that you just make your presence felt in this place this morning, God, because you are here in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated as we continue in worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. So there's a, there's a lot of truth behind this, this, this song. Because he does, I man. He makes beautiful things out of absolutely nothing. And, uh, and that's kind of what you and I are sometimes. We come before him absolutely nothing, broken, and just ready to be rebuilt. And he makes beautiful things out of each and every bit of it. So uh, as we kind of get into this, if you guys want to remain seated, please do so. If you want to join with us as we sing, please do so.
Let's pray. Lord, how grateful we are. We were dead. Lord, we were in rebellion against you, walking away from you uh, to a life that would uh, lead to eternal separation from all that is beautiful and good. And, And you came. And you brought us back to life. And you made us new. Lord, I thank you for those words that the band is singing over us this morning. And I pray that we would receive them, uh, Lord, not just as a beautiful song, but as a promise of what you are doing in our lives. Lord, you are making us. You are making us new. And you are making us beautiful for your kingdom. Uh, Lord, this is what you're doing. Uh, You alone get to say who we are. You alone get to determine our future. You alone get to label us, uh, Lord. And and when you label us, you you have told us who we are in you. A royal priesthood, a holy people, a people set apart unto God to display your character and your glory, a people who live for the glory of God to make visible the kingdom of God, uh, to proclaim the grace of God. Lord, we thank you. Fathers, we worship this morning. Uh, We're mindful of those who were impacted by the tornadoes uh, this weekend, especially our our neighbors in Mountainburg. Uh, We we, we lift them up, especially the churches there. Uh, Our brothers and sisters in Christ, as they seek to be your hands and feet in that area, we pray that you would bless them. Uh, Lord, uh, bless their worship this morning as they gather around uh, the ministry opportunities that, that you have for them there. Uh, Lord, strengthen them. Supply them with, with everything uh, they need uh, to, to do the work that you're calling them to do and, and help us to participate in any way necessary uh, in the midst of that. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for those not only who were affected by the tornadoes, but for those who live in fear, um, uh, the fear that that sparks. Uh, bless them with your peace uh, and that life and, and that uh, calmness that you alone uh, can give. Lord, open up our hearts and minds today to to the word that you would speak to us. Nobody's here by accident. You brought us here today uh, to hear you and to love you and to be loved by you. So help us to walk out of here a people that are changed by what we hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, Imagine that I told you this morning that uh, I had climbed up to the top of a high mountain where a spiritual guru had blessed me with supernatural basketball abilities. Has anybody in here ever played basketball with me before? <laughs> All right, good. All right. So, so, but if you did come watch me play basketball and I told you that I had been blessed with supernatural basketball abilities, what would you expect to see when you watch me play basketball? Oh, it'd be pretty cool. I mean, I can't even, I can barely touch the net. Uh, it'd be cool. I mean, and, and if I couldn't touch the net and I was throwing up bricks left and right, would you doubt my story that I had climbed to the top of a mountain and been supernaturally blessed by a spiritual guru with supernatural basketball abilities? I mean, it'd be reasonable, wouldn't it? You, you might kind of wonder, man, think about this. A bunch of people gather on Sunday morning and what we sing is the same power that raised him from the dead, is alive in me. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is now alive in me. I mean, if if we're going to sing that song, would it be reasonable that our friends and neighbors and family members and the community kind of looks at us and go, well, okay, you're going to sing it. All right, now bring it. That's good. I just thought of that. If you're going to sing it, you better bring it. Somebody that's tweetable even. I mean, finally, I got a tweet. All right, Steve, where's Steve De La Seuss? Where is Steve? Steve, come on, man. That's tweet worthy. All right, thank you. All right. Yeah, and I think that's what we're celebrating on Easter is, man, this is possible. And we first need to believe it ourselves that God is giving us new life, that Christ being raised from the dead isn't about what happens to us for us when we die. It's about something that happens in us right now in the here and now where God equips us for right living, for a holy living, so that we would be a special people set apart unto God. We need to believe that. Man, that's what faith is. It's believing that God, that we are who God says that we are. 
and that God is moving and his power is alive in us so that when we read his word, we read it as promises that God is changing us. That's not a threat. That's not something to be sad about. That's excitement. Man, what we read in scripture, God through Christ is now empowering us through his spirit to live into this new life. Listen, we were dead. We were, all of our spiritual senses were dead. We, did, we didn't grasp the reality of God, the holiness of God. We didn't have communion with God and relationship with God. And God woke us up, raised us from the dead. He made us new. He awakened our spiritual senses so that now you and I, we get to communicate with God. We get to hear God. We get to hear God speak to us, and we get, to, we get to have this amazing privilege of speaking back to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, what we said last week, that's what this whole series, it's about our new life in Christ. It's about, it's about letting the, the resurrection spring us forward into this life that God is giving to us in the here and the now. And we said last week, the foundation for hearing God comes from this foundational scripture in Romans chapter 12. And as we listened to this first verse, we said, this was the foundation upon which is laid uh, hearing God. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... In light of everything he said in the first 11 chapters, in view of who Christ is and his grace, that we are now the children of God by the grace of God. In view of God's mercy, we're to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, not our money, not our time, uh, not our Sunday morning. God, everything I have, it belongs to you. This is true worship. This is the worship that God desires from us. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. We no longer care what the world thinks about what God says is true and right and holy and good. The world no longer determines how you and I live or what we believe, but rather we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds through the word of God and the spirit of God so that we are being brought into conformity with who God says that we are. And we said, then the scripture says, verse two there, then, and as this foundation is in place, he says, then, you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's the foundation. We put that foundation in place. I am a child of God simply by the grace of God. I've offered him everything I have. Uh, I, I am his as much as I am able to with all the faith I have. I place it in Jesus Christ. I, I realize that's going to make me odd and strange in a world that's broken, depraved, and passing away. But I'm now okay with that because I'm no longer conforming to this world in which I live. Instead of being transformed so that I am more and more becoming who God says that I am. I am more and more uh, understanding that what God says is true is true. And how God says to live is how I'm now going to live. Uh, I'm, being, I'm being transformed daily. Then I'm in the place uh, where I can begin to hear God properly. Uh, I'm in that place where, where, where I'm fertile soil for God to plant the seed of his will into our lives. So, so we come to that place now where, okay, okay, God, I, now I, I, I've searched my life and, and, and now I really want to know the will of God because until those things are in place, you don't really want to know the will of God. You're curious about something. You may want something, but you don't want to really hear from God until those things are in place. But when those things are in place, but I really want to hear from God. Now comes the place where I've got to, uh, I've got this particular situation in which I truly desire to hear from God in the midst of this particular choice or decision that I have to make. Now, what normally happens in this moment is we ask ourselves some questions like this. Here's some questions we ask ourselves. Can I do it? Do I want it? Uh, Will I get caught? That's a good one. Is it illegal? Uh, Can I afford it? Uh, Do I have time? Do I want to? How about this one? Do I deserve it? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Do I deserve it? I mean, come on, I came up with these questions out of my own head, so I'm probably not the only one. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming these are, I mean, honestly, will it impress others? Will it make me happy? I mean, in that, I mean how about that? I mean, you're deciding, will it make me happy? Is, is this good? Uh, is it immoral? All those, won't God stop me? That's one of my favorite things people say all the time. If it, won't God stop me if it's not God's will? No, he won't. He'll let you do stupid stuff. 
Don't make God responsible for your stupid stuff. Don't make God responsible. That God will no, He will let you do stupid stuff, and your lives are a testimony to that over and over again, aren't they? Yeah. Don't use. All right. All right. Now, when we use these questions, we end up in these kinds of situations right here. I love this. It's not hard to find. Uh, can I swing my pool stick? Yes, I can uh, if I want to. Can I pop a wheelie on my motorcycle? Well, I certainly can do that. Um, how about this one right here? Can I jump on the wall? Yeah. Do I have time for it? Do I have time to stand on the log and pound on it? Yeah, you, you can. I mean, could I? Uh, fell, yeah, you could. Uh, is this illegal? I don't think so. I mean, is it immoral? I don't, I don't know. I mean, can I stick my head through there? If you ask those kinds of questions, you end up in those kinds of situations. If you ask those questions, you get those outcomes right there. And how many of you can say yes to that? Because those people aren't the only ones who ever did dumb stuff. Out of asking those questions right there, you, you found yourself in, in some bad situations. And so this morning, I think you and I should not ask the same questions everybody else asks in the world. You and I should ask a different set of questions because we're strange and different. We're aliens in the world in which we live. So the questions that you and I are asking are very different. Listen, uh, the question that you ask determines to a great degree the answer that you get. That's really profound. We need to catch a hold of that. Listen, sometimes I know some people who go to the car dealership with this question when they're going to buy a car. Can I afford the payments? That's a question. That's one question. Some of y'all, I know, there's a different question. Is this a good deal? Do you realize that those are two different questions with two very different outcomes? I mean, the, the, the car dealers love it when you come in and say, can I afford these payments? <laughs> I mean, that's what, is it a good deal? It's totally different. The question that you ask determines the answer that you're going to get. And you and I ask different questions than the rest of the world. Proverbs chapter 8. In Proverbs chapter 7 and 8, uh, wisdom is being personified. The wisdom of God uh, is, is being personified here as a woman. And listen to what this says as for who you and I are called to be. We see this throughout Scripture, but Proverbs 8 is just wonderful. I love this. Listen to what it says. Does not wisdom call out? Does not understanding raise her voice? At the highest point along the way, where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gate leading into the city, at the entrance, she cries aloud. To you, O people, I call out. I raise my voice to all mankind. You who are simple gain prudence. You who are foolish set your hearts on it. Skipping over down here to verse 32. Now then, my children, listen to me. This is wisdom speaking. Listen to wisdom. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to my instruction and be wise. Do not disregard it. Blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. All who hate me love death. All who hate me love death. Now, what do you think the question that you and I are going to ask that comes out of this right here? Rather than, can I afford it? Rather than, do I want to? Rather than, does it feel good? Does it make me happy? Do I have time for it? Is it illegal? Is it immoral? Do you catch the question that's going to come out of Proverbs 8 here? Here it is. Is this the wise thing to do? What is the wise thing to do? Think back through your life. And think how many hurts and pains and regrets um, that you could have avoided if you had simply asked a different question. Not do I want to, or does it feel good, but is it the wise thing to do? Uh, a different question that I think the world often asks. Biblical wisdom, here's biblical. Wisdom is simply the practical application of the revelation of God. This is what wisdom is. Wisdom isn't simply knowing something. Wisdom is the practical application of the revelation of God to whatever circumstance you find yourself in in life. To be wise is to ask yourself, in light of what God's word says, 
in light of who God has showed me that I am, in light of how God has worked in my past, in light of what I believe about the future and about this life right here, in light of the season that I am in, in light of the way that the Holy Spirit is moving and nudging me, in light of the Christian community, in light of the circumstances that God is putting uh, around me, in light of the input I'm receiving from other brothers and sisters in Christ, what is the wise thing to do in light of all these things right here? That's wisdom. It's the practical application of the revelation of God through his word and through his spirit, through community, through your circumstances, through your past, and through your future. You say, well, Jeff, man, if if I've got to think about that, that's a lot to think about. Yeah, it is. (laughs) <laughs> How about we think? Uh, that, that takes a minute to sit down and kind of, yeah, that's kind of a good idea that we lay all this out before God. And we say, God, in light of what your word says, in light, of, in light of all that you've showed me in my past history, in light of the season that I'm in right now, in light of what I believe that this life is just a passing speck and eternity goes on forever, in light of what my friends are telling me, in light of the circumstances I'm seeing around me daily, what is the wise thing to do right here? Yeah, it takes a moment. It's laying it out before God and saying, God, I just want to bring all this stuff before you because you're the king of kings and I'm yours and this is not my life. I'm submitting everything to you. So I'm just trying to lay it out before you. And you say, well, Jeff, that sounds like it would be really hard. to. I mean, how do you take all those things into account? Well, here's the good news. Did you hear the beginning of Proverbs 8? Listen again to the beginning of Proverbs 8. Does wisdom not call out? Does wisdom not call out? Does understanding raise her voice at the highest point along the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand beside the gate leading into the city at the entrance. She cries aloud, to you, O people, I call out, I raise my voice to all mankind. Man, what does the scripture say about wisdom? That's good, that's just amen. Wisdom is calling out. Is God hiding wisdom over here in the corner going, you guys are never going to find it? Is it like an Easter egg hunt? No. Man, God is saying, hey, I'm speaking it from the loudest places. I'm crying out. I'm showing you things. I'm, and I, mean, I want to give you wisdom is not hidden from you. James 1.5 says, if you want wisdom, ask God who gives it generously. God longs to give wisdom. He longs to show us how to practically apply the revelation of God to the specific circumstances of our life. God is doing Doing this all the time, the problem is not with God. The problem is not with God. God's not hiding his revelation. God's not. All of scripture speaks that God wants to be involved in relationship with us, and wisdom is crying out to us, trying to show us uh, how we find life. The problem is not with God. When we honestly are submitted to the will of God, and we're laying it all before him, saying, God, in light of your word, and the word is just so much that's so clear in here, um, and in light of uh, prayer and the spirit and the circumstances, God, I'm shouting at you guys. And so I'm, just, I'm screaming at you. And you won't sit around and go, I wish God would talk to me. God's going, no, man, I'm screaming already. Listen, do you really want to hear me is the question. See, and the, and the cool thing that we understand about when we read, the, when we read Proverbs right here is whose wisdom is this? It's not my wisdom, right? It's not your wisdom. This is God's wisdom. And the cool thing about God's wisdom is that God's wisdom is going to agree with God's word. And so we have some very specific things where where if it's God's wisdom, it's going to agree with God's word. God is not divided in himself. Uh, And so this is not your truth. Uh, This is not my truth. This is God's truth. It's going to agree with his word. And if it's God's truth, it's not only accessible to you, it's accessible to others in the body of Christ. You see, our culture today, if you want to be normal, you got to find your truth. You guys hear that in in our world today? Man, that's my truth. Uh, That's cool. If that's your truth, I can't say much about that, can I? I don't don't get it. Uh, But it's your truth and, uh, you know, whatever. God's truth is God's truth. And it's accessible not only to you, but to other people in the body of Christ. And for you and I trying to make a decision that is wise, that's good news because it means that God's wisdom is accessible to other people. 
When God creates Adam in the Garden of Eden and before he's created Eve, he looks at Adam, and you remember what he says to Adam? He looks and he, he looks at Adam. He doesn't say, man, I really messed up. That was a mistake. He looks at Adam and he says, it is not good for the man to be alone. He says, this, this man, what I've created right here, this man was made to be in community with some other people. He, he's just a piece. He's not the whole thing. And there's nothing wrong with the piece that he is. It's just he was meant to be in community with some other people for him to function at a place that I want him to function. At a previous church, I had a guy who was, came to see me one day, and we were talking about his spiritual life, and, and uh, he, he was wanting to grow and, and uh, kind of be a leader in the church. And I said, well, you know, that's great. I'm really excited about what's going on in your life. I said, I, what I really encourage you to do is get connected with some other men. Uh, I encourage you to get connected with some small groups. He said, man, I'm against those small group things. I said, okay, I said, what, what's up? And, and uh, he said, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have time to get connected with some other men. I was like, well, you know. And then he went on about a 30-minute rant about how all he needed was the Bible and him in a closet and how important the Word of God was and how amazing the Word of God was and that all he needed was, was the Bible and a closet and that's all he needed to be who God wanted him to be. And the longer he ranted about that, the more I realized what? He never read the thing. <laughs> he never read it. Uh, you know, he was talking about how precious it was, and he had never read it. Because if he had read it, what would he have realized? That you and I were created for community, that we need each other, that none of us is the whole body, that we're the liver or a toe or a pinky or something. We're not the whole body. We need one another. And so when you and I are trying to discern the will of God, what are we going to do? We're going to gather we're, we're going to, we're going to gather and look and say, God, man, you're revealing this to me. You want to speak. I believe that. I'm laying out my life before you, and I'm going to gather some people around me who are going to help me hear the wisdom of God, and I'm going to test with them the word of God, what God is speaking to me. One of the clearest indicators that you don't want to do the will of God is your unwillingness to bring your decision before some other people in the body of Christ. Listen, any time that you are unwilling to bring what you're struggling with before some other people, you need to hear in your head, I just want to do what I want to do. Now, what's going to happen when you've got that decision, when you just want to do what you want to do, is you're going to find 10,000 reasons not to share that with some other brothers and sisters in Christ. You're going to decide that nobody else could understand you. You're going to decide that nobody else sees what you see. You're going to decide that they don't understand what you have lived through. You're going to, you're going to find fault with all your friends in Christ. And you're going to find some reason uh, not to bring it before them. But here's the truth. And I hope you remember this. The truth is, and the Spirit would reveal to us in that moment, I simply want to do what I want to do without regard to what is wise. When we're seeking wisdom... It's God's wisdom. It's accessible to the body, uh, and it needs to be tested in the body. I had a gentleman come to me uh, uh, at a previous church as well, and he came to me one day. He said, you know what? God told me I need to preach. Uh, I've got a sermon. He told me I need to preach in front of the church. And I said, well, uh, that's good. When God tells me, we'll make that happen. <laughs> I mean, God told you, and that's good. He needs to tell me that too. And then it did never happen. Uh, but, 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 hey, you know, I mean, you know, if he's telling you something and the Spirit is bringing us into unity, we all need to gather around. It needs to be tested and heard by some other people as well. Man, that, that's the beauty of the wisdom of God. It's God's and it's accessible to the body. So here's what's happening. We have a specific uh, question that we're dealing with, a decision that we have to make. We've looked at Romans 12, 1. We said, God, is my foundation in place? Have I, have I wiggled off the altar? That's the problem with living sacrifices. They wiggle off the altar. Uh, Lord, uh, am, am, I just, am I submitted to you in, in the midst of this? Lord, am I thinking about what's going to make me popular? Am I going to impress people? Am I, am, I being, am I trying to conform to the world? And Lord, am, are, am I being transformed daily by you? Am I, am I just with you in the little things? All this stuff, is, am I letting you transform me? And when I lay that foundation, then I'm going to simply say, God, what is the wise thing to do? In light of what your word says, 
in light of all that you've showed me in my past, and I'm going to think about what God has showed me in my past about who I am and how he's dealt with me. In light of the season that I'm in right now, where I am financially with my family and my friends and spiritually, uh, is this the moment I need to make the decision? In light of where I am emotionally, in light of the season that I am, in light of what I believe about eternity, that this life is not all there is, what is the wise thing to do? And I'm going to gather some people around me. And I'm going to talk with them about this. And I'm going to test my answers with them. Uh, and what I find over and over again is when we really get to that place where we really want to hear God and we're really seeking what is the wise thing to do, wisdom is yelling from the mountaintops. Wisdom is speaking. And God is crying out to his people because God wants to speak to you. Now, sometimes people say to me, Jeff, I, I still, I mean, we've, we've done that, and I, and I still don't know. And I ask a clarifying question, and the clarifying question is this. Do you not know or do you not like what you know? And oftentimes when people say, man, I just, I just don't know what I should do. And I say, do you not know or do you not like what you know? People go, wait, well, honestly, I just don't like what I know. Then you have heard wisdom, and you know what is the wise thing to do. Sometimes we do all those things. We come to the place, though, where, where we, we've, we've, sought, we've sought wisdom, and we come to the place where there's no clear decision between A and B or maybe even C, D, E, and F, and there's no clear decision. Oftentimes in those moments, we also need to realize at that moment uh, that God's will is not a tightrope. It's what we talked about last week. It's more like a soccer field. And there are those moments in life when you've got a choice between A and B and C, and God says, my child, it's a soccer field. Cut right, cut left, go up the middle. I'm that big. I am that great. Uh, life's not out of control. I don't want puppets. I want people uh, who are participating in this. You actually have a choice. You actually have some freedom of will, and I'm that big. You can go right. You can go left. I'm going to go with you. Either way you go, you're seeking my will. You're submitted to me, and I really want you to participate in the process. And in those times, people often say, I have not heard from God, but yes, you have. God said, go right, go left, go up the middle. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with you. You choose. I want you to participate in that. That, too, is to hear from God. God is speaking. He is not the problem. Our willingness to hear is what's at issue right here. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for your willingness to speak to us. Wake us up uh, to your voice in the most amazing ways. We thank you that you're speaking to us today, uh, even through this holy communion. Lord, as we gather around this table of bread and juice, we remember that you are telling us that you're the one who died to give us life, that you are present today, guiding and leading us, and you're speaking to us about a future when you will come again. Uh, Lord, and we will stand before you, and the only thing that will matter in our lives in that moment is hearing you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we remember how when Jesus took the bread and he rose up and he gave, he gave you thanks for it. He gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember how when the supper was over, Jesus raised up the cup and he gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of you, your willingness to speak, to reveal yourself, we gather around this table. By your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of bread and juice be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ and make us one with you one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again. We feast at his heavenly banquet. This we pray in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to invite those who are assisting with communion to come forward at this time. Uh, as they are coming forward, I want to remind you uh, that all are welcome to participate in Holy Communion with us here at Grace. Uh, you do not have to be a member of our church. If you are in love with Jesus Christ and at peace with your neighbor, uh, you are welcome to participate in Holy Communion with us uh, this morning. Uh, we'll be receiving communion by intention, uh, which simply means as you come forward, uh, we'll invite you to have your hands cupped. We will take a piece of bread and place it in your hand. Uh, you will then take the bread and dip it in the cup. If you need gluten-free communion, the last station on my far left over here is going to be the gluten-free communion. So if that's important for you, 
Regardless of which section of the church that you're in, we invite you to make your way all the way over here uh, to my far left. We also want you to know we always recognize there are people in our church from different denominations, different Christian traditions. And some of you come from places where you're not allowed to take communion uh, outside of your own church. And if that's, the, if that's where you come from, uh, we understand that. And so you feel free. You're not insulting us. If you want to stay seated while others come for communion, uh, that's a perfectly acceptable choice as well. Come and receive the grace uh, which Christ alone supplies. stand with us. I 
make the same a prodigal return. want to hear a word from God? There it is. There it is. Man, that song's going to be sticking in your head all week long, and it is true. It is God speaking to you. Go from this place as a people led by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. Amen.